Okay, all right. One, two, three. Unless we have Linda now, we definitely have a quorum. Okay, all right, we have a quorum. Then I am going to go ahead and uh, where's where's the record button? Oh, I can't record this. Orca's here. Orca is recording. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order, or should we wait for Jeremy? What do you think? Call it to order. Let's move. Okay. On. All right. All right. I'm Please. calling the meeting to order at 6.06 .06 p.m. We have a quorum. We are currently waiting for Jeremy Hansen. He should be here soon. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? I'm not hearing any additions or changes to the agenda. Okay. Um, public comment. Does anybody have any observations or comments that do not have to do with agenda items? Notices, observations. Okay. Um, the consent agenda. I do not have the details of the consent agenda in front of me. So what we'll do is we'll hold on that and we could go to the financial report. Since I have the people here for the financial report, does that sound reasonable? Sounds good. I, I sent a copy. The finance report was sent out earlier. Um, just in summary, there's 300, just under $375,000 in the bank, of which $322,500 are grant funds committed to pre construction activity. The balance of about fifty-two-five uh, is for administration, uh, most of which is um, budgeted. Uh, there are two invoices totaling about twenty-nine hundred dollars, uh, pending approval by the executive committee um, for project management and and administrator services. Does anybody have any questions for Phil about the financial report? Go, Chuck. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Phil, I was able to uh, talk to CDW about the outstanding Microsoft charge. Um, they had uncovered a billing error that was on their end, so they're just going to attempt to rerun it on our debit card. Um, so you should see that transaction come through this week. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Nice to have a therapy. Uh, Walker, well, did you have a question? I mean, go ahead. Shimon, this is R.D. Can you, um, uh, uh, am I uh, participating in this meeting? I'm I'm unclear. I can't see the rest of you, and I want to make sure I can be heard. I can hear you, R.D. Excellent. Thank you. That's all I need to know. I can hear you. Good. So since we can't see you, if you would like some attention, you're going to need to make a noise. Go boing. Okay, I got it. And I then it. we'll know that you want to say something. Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, there's Jeremy. There's me. Hi, Jeremy. So we've started the meeting. Recording is going on. We've done additions and changes, public comment. We skipped a consent agenda because I didn't have the materials in front of me, and we just did the financial report. So Thank that's you very where much. we are. Yep. All right. So if, why don't you keep going while I find my agenda? Because I just sat down. Berlin Elementary is closed, so we had to find uh, alternative accommodations. Yeah. Okay. So is Jeremy Matt here? I don't see Jeremy Matt. He's not here yet either, so we can't do the clerk's report. Jeremy Antides, can you give the PM's report, please? Absolutely, I can give the PM report. So we uh, let, let's let's talk about uh, contractors and where they're at. The uh, pole inventory just passed the 50% milestone. So yeah. we've got half of the poles in in our five towns have been at at, at least uh, some level of, of of data recorded on them. Not equally for all because some are more difficult to get to than others. But we certainly have a ton of of data. Um, and then we also have uh, folks are in all five towns. Uh, Alan, including Worcester, you ought to you ought to. Uh, see or hear or notice that there are folks out there monitoring polls. Um, and then we have the, the high level design is at approximately 15% complete. That one's a little tricky to get a full percent complete on because the, the various tasks don't add equally to the percent complete. 
But that 15% is as of two weeks ago, because we have our biweekly meetings on Thursday, which is when we get our update. So that, uh, that number will definitely change, and we are on track to have that completed by the end of the year. So that looks good. And then we also have a, a similar amount complete for our uh, Northfield Rocks, Roxbury, and we are also due for our biweekly update. So the information we have for that is, is a little bit stale. Um, so we should be getting more information on that this week as to what our uh, uh, continued progress is on Northfield Roxbury and on Moortown, um, the CARES grant progress really has been zero. Uh, we have done poll inventories because they overlap with the poll inventory information that we've done with, uh, that we've, we've, we just had to do for more towns. So there happens to be an overlap there. Um, but it, it's looking very unlikely that we're going to get progress, uh, suitable to capture the monies available for that grant. So that's, uh, I mean, we haven't spent any money, so it's not a clawback situation, uh, but it, it, it really does not look like we're, uh, we're going to get there at this point in time. Um, Jerry, Jerry, do you have a sense of, of when, what are, what, when do you think we should cut bait then? I mean, because it sounds like, you know, if, if it's not likely to happen, I mean, if anybody else has any thoughts, I mean. Yeah, I think I think we're getting close to cutting bait time, but I'll let I'll let David chime in. He and I have been going back and forth on this. So am I, I guess I'm not muted. Um, the probability is 50-50, I would say, at this point. Um, it really depends how quickly we can get a developer operator signed on board, because really it would be up to getting them to do it. And from what I gather, um, it doesn't take a well. It does it, the poll make ready is probably a bigger problem than anything. And tomorrow, this week we should be figure out. We have all the poll inventory done in in uh, Moortown. In every uh, poll, we had the contractor decide rank uh, level of make ready requirements from none to low to medium to high. And so based on those numbers and looking at the Moortown CARES route, we should be able to say yay or nay just on poll make ready. And um, if I just took a peek just before the meeting, it looks like most of those polls need work. So Yeah, and a lot of that work is uh, clearing just to be able to get to the poll is, you know, clearing the, the brush that's grown over time so that that's a time-consuming process but yeah. as david said david says 50 50 okay uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll make that decision pretty soon i believe dave uh right. jeremy okay that sounds good uh can i tap in here siobhan okay yeah oh ahead, absolutely chuck. it's all for me yeah go ahead chuck uh, question, would we proceed with any build out in Moortown, even if we don't get uh, the funds or would that put that Moortown pilot project basically back into the mix? Asking for a friend. Well, you you guys are in, in area A. I mean, you're you're one of the first areas to get. So it, it, it may not get the kickstart that it would have gotten by the end of 31 December if we decide not to pursue it. <laughs> Um, but you're still, you're still, you know, right, right there in the mix. Thank you. Any questions for Jerry? Okay. Anything else, Jerry? Uh, well, Phil, I see Phil raised his hand there. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little late. Yeah. Um, when will we see um, invoices for those? You know that's a really good question. I, I've, I've been thinking about that. Now that we're now that we're past the fifty percent on the poll inventory, that that's typically a, a point where you might want to send inventories in and 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 excuse me, send invoices in and 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 let the state know that we've moved forward on that. At the rate they're going, I must say they're going to be finished in the next few weeks. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure what the decision 
would would be on when to do, you know, do we do it once and pay them all or do we do it in two pieces? Nobody's asking for money yet because they're all interested in the next, <laughs> they're all interested in the next 12 towns. So they're, they're, they're not asking for today's payment, hoping for tomorrow's, but um, I, I'm not, I, I really don't know the politics well enough to know when the best time to do it is, but we are at the 50% point. Yeah, it'd just be probably good to um, you know, let the state know we're making progress. And that's certainly a way to do that. Cool. Right. Yeah, well, and, and we have regular progress reports to file anyways. But uh, yes, and, and I think, well, what did Rob say? We had the uh, we had to have the invoices in by November f or it was something earlier than what we thought, right? There was there was some date that we had to have the documentation or the checks. But, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the final invoices. We had to start the invoice uh, chain. We didn't have to have final invoices in, but we had to we had to be billing against it. So we're, we're, I mean, we're in a good spot as far as all of that goes. Um, and and only with this you know past uh, weeks of recording did we pass the fifty percent mark. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, Jeremy, do you see Walker? His hand is raised. Yeah. I I don't see any I don't see hands raised for some They're reason. All just That's all good. Um you see chat? Because I'll put them in chat for you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh so considering the just visual quality of some of the polls that I see around Vermont, if we have a poll that really needs to be replaced before it can even be made ready. Is that a relationship or a workflow that we've already worked out with Washington Electric? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. If 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 we get to a poll and the poll needs to be replaced based on Washington Electric standards without us, but the, we're just bringing it to their attention because we're saying, "Hey, we got to work this poll," then they're going to replace it. If it's if it's something that our adding to the poll is what tips the balance and makes the poll have to be replaced, then that 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 cost is 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 shifted over on on out on us. Um, so we have this you know we have this working understanding, uh, not only with WEC. I mean this is a common, uh, pretty much a common understanding. But a lot of those WEC polls have been out there a long time and yeah, neglected. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another. Thing that I, you know, we're we're going into more and more flooding and more and more water damage and more and more problems going forward. So it's something that is probably going to be a, a long term hassle forever that we have to think about. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'd categorize it as a hassle as as much as a factor that we need to consider and incorporate into our plans. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, you know. It, it, if it needs to be done, it needs to be done. Right. It's, and it's it's built into the make ready costs that we're already forecasting anyways for X number of poles per mile that need to be replaced. Um, and that's based on um, actual historical data from EC Fiber and other contractors. So it's it's something that we have pretty well um, pretty well understood. Uh, whether it actually hits those numbers or not, it's 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 impossible to say again once until we get folks out there, and you get some analysis done. But yeah, we I I, I think we we have a pretty good sense of it. Awesome, cool. Yeah, and let let me just add to that, Walker. We we, we it's actually a high number of poles being replaced that we're we're kind of conservative in that because we've seen some pretty high numbers uh, from recent work that's been done with WEC, so we're incorporating that information. So. Uh, yeah, it's expensive, but it, it needs to be done. It needs to be done, and I think it's something we can communicate to towns in our outreach that, you know, during this inspection, we're not only laying, you know, a plan for fiber, but we're also kind of upgrading the whole system, or we're spurring it to be upgraded. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Siobhan? I just wanted to comment that I have seen on Bisson Road, which is right down the road from me, uh, Washington Electric was out clearing brush around the poles all along all along the, the the route there. So I know that they're at least out doing some work someplace by the on their own because they had their sticker on the truck. 
Cool. Uh, so, Siobhan, do they have their sticker or our sign? It had it had Washington Electric Co-op on it, on on, okay. on the side of the truck that was doing all of the chewing stuff up. Yeah, we we, we don't we don't have any folks out in Orange just yet. Yeah. Okay. And they're doing regularly scheduled maintenance that really has nothing to do with us at this time. They're, they're out there doing what they need to do on their schedule. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Jerry? Okay. Not yet. All right. Let's move along. A pre-construction grant. So uh, we submitted the pre-construction. I see you. I see you giggling down there, David. Yeah. We we submitted the pre-construction grant uh, last week, uh, Thursday, and uh, their timeline. I'll talk about their timeline before we we go back to the uh, yeah the the issues. Um, they want to have it seven days in advance so that the board can review it before their meeting. Um, they don't have a meeting this upcoming, or they didn't have a meeting this week, but they're, we're going to review it on Monday, this coming Monday, as I recall. Um, Rob Fish has sent us some follow-up questions, which some of the things that he was asking were, um, you know, we might have anticipated. Some of them were not really part of the, uh, the grant application, and I don't think that we were planning on responding with, but there's uh, there's quite a bit of additional stuff that he's asking for. Um, and he's asked us to essentially, and please, if, if I'm misunderstanding this, David or Jerry or any, or Ray for that matter, or, um, if he wants us to essentially to resubmit the packet again, he wants us to rewrite it, add the new stuff and resubmit it. Does that does that jive with what you're understanding, David? Yes. Yeah. He also wants to see a red line so that he can look at the changes that we made based on their questions. And he wants it, oh, by the way, now. Yeah. That's, <laughs> well, so just realistically, um, I mean, so it's, it's not going to be today, uh, maybe tomorrow, but I mean, <laughs> so... I don't know if that resets the uh, the time clock to review it, but um, but yeah, we will take another swing at it because there were some you know, lingering questions, I guess. Anything else that we should be talking about with this? Yeah, the uh, they're limiting us to less money than we need for pre-construction. So every CUD was given an allocation CV fibers was 2.8 million, and I believe our grant application was for 4.5 or something. So we're having to revise our amount of ask, but we're going to tell them we still need this pre-construction money that hasn't, you know, that's not available. So that will delay our work, just so that the board knows what's going on. Um, it's very unfortunate. So uh, yeah, so it may, may require us. Hopefully, it won't require us to shift the timetable too too much. But just in terms of what we thought we were asking for, what we thought we were potentially getting is uh, changed a bit. Any uh, any questions about the pre-construction grant? All right, moving along. Uh, annual report. Anything that we need to report about the annual report? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jerry. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I apologize because I started the annual report a couple of weeks ago. I laid it out in bulleted form. David's heard me say this five times already, but I, I just I haven't gotten to it. So the uh, annual report will be out for draft tomorrow or the next day for folks to review so that we can we can finalize it. Um, I mean, it looks good. We've done a lot. Oh my God. They, you know, we've got so much going on. Um, but I, but I did manage because of, of the work that we had to do for these grant applications that had to get out. I, I pulled from the grant applications and created the annual report, 
But like I said, it's in bullet form. So now I, I, I just need to make it a little bit of text. It's only a couple of pages. Um, so my intention is to get that out for folks to review tomorrow, the next day, no, more, no further than that. And then we can, I think we have still two weeks to get it out, but. Yeah, yeah. The, the 28th, I think, something. Somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, so if we can then. Uh, 20, 22nd. 22nd. Thank you, Ray. So I don't know if we need to to approve it. I mean, we're sending a draft. It's not really getting approved. We're taking the the draft budget that we've um, um, not not approved. We've accepted. We have a we have that draft, and that we'll be sending to the towns. Um, we could we could put it onto the executive committee if it'll be done in the next two days. But uh, Chuck. We also have a communications committee next Thursday um, where we would have one more opportunity to approve it. Do we want to authorize the communications committee to approve the language of the annual report? It was that a motion? No Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. so, 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 so Siobhan seconded. Who, who moved that? Was that? I moved it. Was it. R, it was RD. OK. Yeah. So, Thank you, RD. So, uh, OK, so that sounds like uh, we're delegating that over to communications committee. Any objections to that, Chuck? Does that seem OK? OK. Any other thoughts on this? Uh, I'm going to try to get this out to everybody tomorrow or the next day, and then we can move it over to Chuck. And we have a uh, we ha do have a discussion time set for in the executive committee, if there's anything that we want to talk about then. And then the communications committee can take it from there as well. Okay, any, any objections to this motion to assign this task to the communications committee and have them be the gatekeeper? Okay, I'm gonna say that motion passes unanimously then. Uh, let's see, town outreach update. Uh, do we have any updates related to ARPA funds, town updates, et cetera? Uh, Siobhan, then Chuck. Um, I met with my select board um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they were ostensibly talking about it was originally about the the letter that we had that we had sent to them. I don't know a month ago about saying we may need you to have a cabinet that we can put stuff in, or I can't remember what we called the technical need letter that we sent to the, all the towns. And so they had questions about that, but they had forgotten that they had questions about that by the time we got, finally managed to meet up. So they weren't clear. They couldn't remember exactly what they wanted to know. So I kind of explained what that letter was saying, and then they wanted an update on how everything is going. And they're very excited about how everything is going. They do have a committee that is uh, working on how they're distributing their various um, uh funds that are coming into the town and we are high up on that list. Um, there's just, they, they seem a lot more excited and a lot more interested now than they were two years ago. So I'm, I'm really pleased. We had a really good meeting and they're lo really looking forward to getting the report, which they never cared that much about before. So yay. And right. that's my report back. <laughs> Very good information. Thank, thanks, Siobhan. So uh, Chuck, David, then Alan. Uh, I met with the Moortown Select Board last week again, um, and sort of the same status quo as before, where they remain very favorable about the project and very excited to hear that you know Moortown remains top of list. However, uh, they are very much holding the Vermont League of City and Towns line of uh, playing wait and see, and are unwilling to commit funds just yet. Um, it sounds like when they're ready to decide, we will get a portion of it. Um, however, they're not really ready to decide about any of it just yet. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the league, uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar, the league has been advising towns to be very slow and deliberate and conservative about how they decide to use these funds as new information emerges over time that helps better clarify the different ways you can use it. And, and, and so they're, they're definitely following that. And of course, in our community, and in fact, as our backup delegate, we have a very influential member of the league. Um, and she definitely has the ear of the select board 
way better than I do. So, uh, you know, I did, I did my best to answer all the questions they have, but they're, they're just not willing to move just yet. Okay. Uh, David Healy, Alan, David Lawrence, and then Jerry. Yeah. I met with the, uh, Calislock board last night, gave them an update of where we are and surprise I me. And I meet with them every two months, but they seem to forget half of what we're doing. <laughs> but the more important thing out of four, I mean, we talked about serving the underserved and I had the map of the underserved and four of the five select board members are underserved, but they didn't know they were underserved. So that actually worked. And just to let you know, <laughs> Point, pointing them out exactly that, whoops, you get, you don't have any service. Um, they are also in the wait and see, they've, they've, eaten, they've drunk the uh, Kool-Aid from the League of Cities and Towns. And to that note, today on a call, or yesterday on, a, on the Vicuda call, which I didn't, I watched the video today, uh, the Vicuda administrative assistant person and the chair of Vicuda, who's the chair of Easy, Easy Fiber, a meeting with um, uh, the head of uh, the League of Cities and Towns tomorrow. On top of that, if you want to know, um, we can put this out to everybody. Um, Christine Hallquist, the chair of the board, put out, I did a presentation to the League of Cities and Towns annual meeting last week. And it's about a 12-point PowerPoint slide illustrating the history that what's what's going on, what what they'd like to get from towns. Um, she did a pretty nice job. Um, I'm going to send that to our town. Um, so that's sort of my update. I did. I still made a big pitch for the money, um, but they're certainly they're going to form a committee. So we're a little bit behind other other towns. All right, uh, Alan, David, Lawrence, and Jerry. So two things uh, I've run into in the last uh, couple of weeks. The first is uh, somebody in my town asked whether, well, let me back up a second. Uh, most of you know Worcester did allocate 50,000 for CV fiber. Somebody in my town asked me, doesn't the town, doesn't the town itself through a town meeting or a town vote have to approve this expenditure or this allocation? And I've heard that issue raised in at least one other town. I think it came up in Barry. But it's something that that uh, we all should be ready for. Um, and the second thing is, uh, I've been going through minutes and listening to some of the meeting tapes of the Vermont Community Broadband Board, and I'm a little bit concerned about a line that's coming out that uh, if you're in a town where RDOF uh, um, grants were awarded. Um, you, your town is not going to be able to use ARPA funding to do a build out in your town. This came up in the uh, June, the September 16th um, community broadband meeting. And last, last <laughs> that people were saying, yes, we think this is something of concern. And Christine Hallquist said that uh, they probably need to have a legal opinion on this. But that was really worrisome to me. It seems, it just seems impossible that most of us who who have our ARDOF blocks in our towns, it seems impossible that we wouldn't be able to use some of the ARPA money to do uh, to help pay for for part of the build out. But it just seems like one of those questions that's now popped up. It was Clay Purvis that brought this brought this up the September 16th meeting. And it, it, it just seems like a little bit of a push, uh, sort of like the League of Cities and Towns slow down kind of thing. So uh, we've got to we've got to stay on top of of what's happening when and what's still possible. So so that, that that's actually interesting, Alan, because hearing from Rob Fish and I don't know if that was, this was like a realization that came at different times and I don't have the most up to date information. Um, but I was under the impression from what he had told us that uh, we could we could use these funds that we're you know that have been allocated that we've you know that we've requested to to build in these Ardoff locations. I mean, Dave, was, I'm trying to think who else. David, were you on the call with me? If I was, I don't remember. Okay. Um, I probably I, was. I, I, I seem I seem to remember him saying that. So so yeah, I, I guess that's something that we have to find out a bit more concretely then. Yeah, Clay gave a presentation at the uh, September sixteenth 
uh, board meeting. So if anybody wants to go and look on the tape, uh, you can you can jump to that part pretty easily. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting, and I, I, I people obviously were quite concerned about this, but some of the board members seem to think there might really be something to this idea that uh, those getting RDOF blocks, those towns getting RDOF blocks, are going to be blocked from using ARPA funds. Uh, it seems crazy to me, but it's out there. What? Yeah, the, the department wants us to fail. <laughs> Uh, All right. Uh, do, mm -hmm. oh, so hold on. Our, no, our, never mind. Okay. I, I was just. I can't. I. I'm finding it difficult to um, imagine what the connection between um, the Ardolf blocks and uh, and the uh, and ARPA funds might be. Well, I mean, it, why should I? I. I. I, I don't see a. a I'm well, not the, sure. I see where this where the the, the line of logic. It connects these two. The line of logic is the federal government doesn't want to spend twice for the same sorts of improvements in the same location. So they're saying FCC got this. Ardoff is paid for. It has this federal budget line and it's covering this. I mean, that's that's the logic that I, I imagine that they're following. I don't know that the rules actually say that that's the case at all. But I mean, so this is, I think, where the, where the legal opinion has to come in. Um, Ardoff blocks only are only exist in places where there hasn't people haven't groups haven't availed themselves of previous rounds of federal grant money and assistance. Let's say. All right. So I've got uh, David Lawrence, Jerry, uh, Tom, and Jeremy. So uh, the, the David Lawrence from Middlesex, the select board by way of the town clerk contacted me to join their meeting. Uh, a week from today on the 19th, because uh, Grace Vinson is going to be there to speak to, to the select board about the ARPA funds, um, if uh, you know, from the Regional Planning Commission. And um, Peter Hood, our, our eminent selectman, has asked specifically, he has two questions about um, how would the Middlesex residents benefit by turning over some Ar ARPA funds to CV Fiber? And that's pretty straightforward. Um, but the one question I wasn't quite sure about, the second big question is whether there would be a provision for low-income Middlesex residents to get a discount on broadband if Middlesex donates ARPA funds to this project. And so, I don't know that they're, they, they might be orthogonal issues. Like, I, I guess the over, our overarching question is, is there going to be a low income discount in, at all? Which, all right. There you go. Better up, J Jerry, rather. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use this to answer that question somewhat and then also take my hand raise uh, at the same time. So one of the things that we've been thinking about as, as to, how to how to deal with these uh, town ARPA funds is to pay for the drops. So, and, and pay for the drops means if, if you're gonna get a service and the service is gonna cost $55 a month, that's great. But there's all of the, um, all, everybody that is in this business also has a cost for getting from the nearest pole to your house, and that's called the drop. So that cost can be 500 bucks, it could be 200 bucks, it could be 1,000 bucks, 600, six, uh, 1,600 bucks. It's, it's, an, it's, you know, it's not cheap. It depends on where you are, especially in Vermont. You could have three poles before you get to the guy's house, right? So what, what we've been thinking about, and I don't think a decision has been made, so I'm not gonna speak for the group, but what we've been thinking about is using the local town ARPA funds to pay for the drop. And the drop is a barrier to entry using an, a, you know, an economics term, because even though it's $55 a month, if you have to pay for a $1,500 drop, you know, that is going to spike your cost, right? So that you may be able to afford the 55 a month, but 55 plus 1500 now Put, puts you out of so it, it kind of answers both questions in a in a in a fuzzy way uh, in, in that it makes it more affordable if the towns are willing to pay for the drops and it's also extremely direct 
town benefit use of that money if they pay for the drops. But we haven't made a decision yet as to how that money will be used. I want to lay that out. But this is one way that it, that it could be very beneficial. And I'll stop there. So yes, yeah, so if I could just add, it, it really hinges on the structure of the agreements that we sign with the towns. Um, so hopefully we will uh, be able to find something that's um, acceptable to everybody. And, and But I, I think that some of the um, criteria for the grant include that there is some feature of there, that we offer some sort of low income option one way or the other. Did, did you get the, to weigh in on the thing that you wanted to talk about, Jerry? Well, I had one last yes, thing. Yes, I did. I'm about, done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, go ahead, David. Well, and then just the last thing about, well, I guess two quick things. One is uh, Middlesex as a whole I, is very enthusiastic about this. Uh, you know, I've heard nothing about people that are really anxious to see it all happen. So, you know, that's a uh, good it, kind of good momentum from at least the town support. And uh, then the other thing is I'll just reconnect with you, Jeremy, like on Monday, just to make sure that I'm staying on message for, um, you know, what we want to communicate to the select board. So. All right. Sounds great. OK, um, I've got uh, Tom Fisher, then Jeremy Matt. Yeah, I think uh, most of the things that have been said about the other towns also applies to East Montpelier. Um, as far as wanting to have more public way in and concerns about um, low income and so forth. Um, one thing that has come up, uh, looking at the minutes, I just sent you an email on this, Jeremy. Um, maybe we just address it here or separately. But uh, there was a confusion back at the select board's uh, September, I think, 13th meeting uh, about that cash flow term that we were seeking funds to be used as cash flow. I, I know there's been a few committee meetings since then where the topics come up. I didn't know, has this circled back and been addressed with the town board, select board, or uh, is this still something that we need to clarify for them about what exactly we're asking for funds for? So that's that's a good question. I've not reached out to East Montpelier in in particular. I th I think I think we originally heard this from what regional planning that we were at, and so that the the thought was that we were using this for cash flow, and uh, and that was and maybe I have phrased this wrong. It was it's for a project. I mean the MOU suggests a project, but I said that this would allow us to have um, the funds on hand and we wouldn't have cash flow issues while we're waiting for the state to cut us checks for these other grants. So the phrasing probably got misinterpreted somewhere along the way, and it, but it wasn't like, no, just give us some cash so it's easier for us. That's, it was really just to, so yeah. that we could kind of accelerate the project a bit. In the minutes they say they now have the funds in hand they were considering of, of you know handing out what they had already promised but that this issue of whether or not it is a a valid um way of spending the money was a concern that held them back at this point so it might be worth us reaching back out to them so i would suspect that they're still waiting to hear definitively from the attorney so i think it's still in limbo in terms of rob halpert chewing on this and being comfortable with this. But I think there's also the the double hang up then of the, the structure of the agreement, obviously, which I, what Christine's presentation, I think, offered several options for what that what the shape of that might look like. Um, Christine Hallquist, that is from um, VCBB. Um, so but then there's actually going to have to be real legal review of an actual real MOU rather than just the structure that we're talking about. So I'm optimistic that we can get there, but I, I don't think as, as much as Seth might want to just pull the trigger and go ahead, I think that it's probably best if we wait for both of those hurdles to, to be crossed first. Um, but I mean, is it, is it valuable if I, you know, send Bruce an email or if I send Seth an email or if I call them and just say, um, I think I misspoke. Is that valuable? I think it would be valuable for one of us too. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to, to do that, but um, it might be better coming to you so you can clarify exactly, you know, what the intention is here. Sure. And, and do you think it'd be better for me to talk to Seth or better to talk to Bruce? Um, probably Bruce. Okay. Okay, I am adding it to my list. Call Bruce in East Montpelier. 
All right, I have uh, Jeremy, Matt, then uh, Siobhan. Yeah, so this is uh, about the ARPA thing that Alan brought up. Is that for, or uh, is that a prohibition, presumably for towns that got RDOF money like through the R consortium, or is that any town that got any RDOF money? Like, for example, I'm thinking about Orange, where it was consolidated that one, would they then be ineligible for these ARPA funds? Yeah, Jerry. Sorry, two computers at one time. Uh, somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the RDOF is by census block and not by town. Yeah, so yeah, if correct. there's there there are multiple census blocks in each town, so it doesn't it, it, it's it's more granular than that. And, and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong on this. That sounds like you get extremely confusing then. Right. Um, does that answer your question, Jeremy? Ish. <laughs> Ish. I mean, it's yeah. Okay. Siobhan? Unmute myself. I just wanted to add that the VCBB is taking affordability seriously. They've, they've had a presentation from Holly Groschner who um, shared that with us in the policy committee. We are working on baking affordability and keeping low income Vermonters high on our list and making sure that we're doing as much as we can to reach out to them. But that is a, a larger issue than just us. But that, so that's why VCBB is looking at this. Um, but it's it's like on the radar, it's there. So when it comes up in your towns, you can say that it's being looked at on a statewide level because it's not just Orange, it's not just I don't know, Worcester. It's it's we've all got issues and and so there are concerns, you know, like with with uptake and not just the installation, but are they going to be able to even afford 55 a month or you know, whatever. There's a whole lot of issues that I didn't even really think about until I saw Holly's presentation, which I believe Alan would be happy to send on to anybody who might be interested in it if uh, if uh, if they want it. So, um, but it's a it's a good read and it's very interesting. And so it it is being discussed. We are very concerned about it, and we do want it to be part of all of this because we do not want to perpetuate the gaps that exist. And I'm done. Agreed. And as, as David put in the chat, we're actually obliged to address this and talk about it in the grant application for the pre-construction funds and presumably for any future rounds of funding as well. So that's not uh, that's that that's not we're not missing that in terms of of how we're explaining how we're going to spend the money. All right. Anything else about um, town outreach, ARPA funds, et cetera? Okay, moving along to accounting auditor RFP. I think, Ray, this is yours. Yeah, okay. So uh, the Finance Committee will be making a recommendation to the Executive Committee on Thursday uh, for uh, an accounting firm and an auditing firm yeah, for them to take action on. Uh, the Finance Committee is meeting tomorrow night to uh, finalize its recommendation for the accounting firm which I'm confident that we'll reach some sort of a conclusion. So, um, and it's to be noted that in the questions that we got back from Rob Fish concerning the uh, pre-construction grant, there was a question in there is, uh, have you hired your accounting grant management, management firm? And uh, we're able to say, we will be hiring one this month, we expect. The executive committee is meeting on Thursday. So um, it's they realize it's important. We know it's important. Um, uh, so we expect to we expect them to probably be engaged uh, in November. Uh, funding available. Where's Phil? <laughs> uh, presuming that we have funds available for that. All right. Any questions for Ray about the accounting auditor RFP? Okay. Thanks, Ray. Um, the Make Ready RFP. Where's that at? Oh, so, Chuck, I see your hand up. Hold on. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I, I did have a quick question for Ray. Ray, is this going to necessitate a a special meeting of the executive committee to approve a contract later in the month? Um, possibly. Okay. Yeah, I haven't worked out the the language of the motion yet for Thursday night, but uh, uh, possibly. Okay. Thank you. All right. Make ready. The uh, make ready. So back um, within the last 60 days, the um, board approved us issuing an RFP for getting uh, make ready contractors under retainer contracts. Um, and after looking at the landscaping the landscape of um, how this these make ready contractors actually work, there's a program called One Touch Make Ready. And this program requires that utility pole owners uh, provide the PUC with the list of pre-qualified contractors for doing make-ready work in the event that they themselves can't do the work or uh, won't do the work or are willing to waive the 60-day period, blah, 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 and such that we then could engage them. So what this really requires is that um, uh, this, this would put us in a position, frankly, of doing sole source contracting with the, with the contractors that WEC and GMP have identified for those pre-qualified uh, contracts, as opposed to doing an RFP. So um, it's not a problem with GMP because they have posted their three contractors. <laughs> and, however, WEC has not. And um, both Jerry and David can comment on on the efforts that we've been making with WEC to identify pre-qualified contractors. And uh, we're slowly getting there, I think. Okay, any questions for Ray about this? Okay, thanks for that, Ray. Um, where did my agenda go? There it is. Uh, operator RFP. Where are we with that? David. Mm -hmm. So we, um, you know, the RFP went out. I think last month I talked about where we were. We got five proposals and we were <laughs> sending out questions to the two top candidates. We got those questions back this month and then we conducted interview. The team it conducted interviews with both firms. And this week we're doing, some of us are doing site visits. Yesterday we did a site visit, Jerry and I did a site visit on one of them and tomorrow we have a site visit with the other one. And hopefully from that, sometime later this week, the team will get together and come up with its recommendation for the uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting for next week. And from there, hopefully the Planning and Development Committee will make its recommendation to Hopefully, a special meeting of the executive, the board, not the executive committee. It's not in the newsletter. Um, and at that time, I mean, next, as we go through this, we'll have to have, you know, the discussions have to be held confidential for a while, but we'll get there soon. <laughs> um, I just want to say for those who have not been able to participate in this, it's um, it's been a lot of work and. Green date 24. The firms have been all very cooperative and top notch. Great. Yeah. So I, we really can't have too detailed of a discussion about it, but uh, yeah, things things seem to be moving forward pretty smoothly. I think. I think we got some some good options. The other the other point is the we are now behind three of the other CUDs in the state. DV Fiber has hired somebody. NEK Broadband has hired somebody, and Maple Broadband has hired somebody. And, so uh, we'll be next. We'll be next. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, and by the way, the, the other thing, both both these teams will be doing the engineering design and all the construction managing. So the, they take the, this these both project. The teams are going to be responsible for everything from development to uh, construction to uh, procurement to ISP, to marketing, to everything. So I think when you hear the whole proposals, you'll be very happy. 
I'll be very happy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Siobhan? So that when you said procurement, that made me – that reminded me that VCBB asked all of the C – the CUDs for how many miles do we have to cover across the whole state so we could do a big purchase? Yeah. So that just, I'm sure that everybody's thinking about that, but I just want to get that back out there in case it, it had been forgotten. Yeah, there's and there's a lot of moving parts in terms of how, how that's going to work with VCBB and VCUDA and the individual CUDs and the funders and the state. So yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cogs and gears, but it, yeah, it, but it seems like it seems like that process is is moving forward, with, you know, with bulk purchasing and some other um, some other fun stuff. Yeah, David. Yeah, the the state has found a vendor who is willing to sell us a thousand miles of fiber of two different kinds, and has it available. And right now, the backlog for fiber is six to eight months. So we are hopeful this thing will work out positively. Um, that anyway, that's where it is at the moment. But it's it's also one of the one of the really great effects of having a VCBB and Vicuda that they can go and chase this down, and VCBB anyways can sort of have the gravitas of the state of Vermont, like that they're part of government and they can go and sort of snap. Not that they snap their fingers and make it happen necessarily, but that they they're taken seriously. When they when they say we want to buy a thousand miles of fiber, and that's not something that they've done, and they don't have like an existing contract for it. So, yeah, that is good news. Any other questions for David about this? Okay, I think we got a short one tonight, folks. Um, did we miss any agenda items that we need to go back to? Consent agenda. The consent agenda. Okay, so I move that we and the clerk's report. The clerk's report. Okay. So let's do the consent agenda first. Um, I move that we approve the September 14th minutes in their most recently um, provided form. Second. 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 Okay. Sh Siobhan got it first. She got yeah, the first, yeah. second. Um, any further discussion? Any objections? Okay. Passes unanimously. Uh, Jeremy, Matt, anything to report? No, um, I've been keeping up with the minutes, but that's kind of been the bulk of what I've been working on. So that's my report. All right. Any questions for Jeremy? Okay. So let's go to um, let's go to the roundtable. I see. Uh, let's see. RD. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I didn't um, raise my hand during the. Uh, recounting of uh, approaches to select boards, but I've been uh, in conversation with my select board three times. <clears throat> they are following the um, League of Cities and Towns recommendation, holding back on making any commitments, but I think they're very favorably disposed to making a contribution, and I think uh, uh, Worcester is, uh, has become the benchmark. Um, so uh, I'm very hopeful that they will be, if <laughs> if we're if we can, that the Cabot will kick in some ARPA funds. Wonderful, that's great to hear, RD. Thank you for that. Um, Alan, um, this this was an interesting meeting because there's, I think we're beginning to realize there's a lot of information out there, but not all in one place, and. Trying to put all this stuff together is getting more and more difficult and knowing what's really happening, like with the Ardoff funds and, and mm, ARPA yeah. flash and that kind of stuff. One of the things I wondered about is, is anybody monitoring the community broadband board on a regular basis for the CUDs and issuing summaries of every meeting with bullet points for the most important items that came up? Um, kind of. I mean, there is a there's a uh, a hire for what's his position name for Vicuda? Um, is he executive director? I don't know what he is. Project okay, coordinator. Project, project coordinator. Okay, project so coordinator. yeah, so he's at all of those meetings. Uh, we hear from Rob Fish from those meetings. 
Um, but is there something, you know, specifically organized so that the CUDs get a kind of the lobbyists report, like you might expect a lobbyist to provide to a client or something like that as they're sitting on a committee meetings? Um, I, not, not as such. I guess I, I find it really valuable to sit and listen um, to the community broadband board meetings. I mean, a lot is being discussed that is going to have a big impact on what we do and what all the other CUDs do. It's everything from equity issues, as Joanne was talking about earlier, to the to the RDOF and 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 ARPA stuff. Uh, and it it just sort of <laughs> it makes me feel nervous that we don't have almost like a journalistic ongoing reporting of what both the community broadband board and as as well as the Vicuda uh, board is doing. It it just would help if we had a more centralized information bank. I think. Fair enough. Jerry, you want to respond to that? All right, Alan. I heard you identify a problem. I'm waiting for your solution. I mean, what what so what do we do about this? I mean, can we can we have somebody that is going to be at each meeting or do we do we talk to the to the gentleman that's at Vicuda and say, "Hey, this should be on your part of your job description that you do this for for all the I mean, how what what you've identified is spot on. Uh, I'm just not sure where in the volunteer world we're going to fill that gap. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, one idea I had was to get a team of people, and each one of us over a period of six months would agree to rotate on who is reporting on, say, a community broadband board meeting. So we won't have to be doing it every time. Um, and I, you know, I'd be willing to try and give that a shot, but maybe, maybe John Walters is, is John on the call tonight? I didn't, I, I can't tell, but, yeah, he's here. you know, maybe John would have some ideas about how we could, uh, oh, hi, John. Uh, what, maybe John would have some ideas about how we could do some closer monitoring of the community broadband board. I mean, I, I, as a former journalist, I, I have to tell you, there are some terrific stories that somebody should be writing about some of the issues that are coming up in their meetings. And I'm just amazed that the press is not uh, making much of an effort to cover this. That's really what we need. We need press coverage. And and there isn't that. And so we've got to figure out a way to get that information ourselves. I think I think the staffer for Vicuda is a logical place, a logical person to do this work. Because, I mean, Vicuda needs to know what the broadband board is doing and, and vice versa. So um, he's he's in those meetings. I don't I don't think it would be a big lift to ask to ask him to do a, to do a write up a summary you know by the end of the week after the after that meeting happens uh, Walker I see you have your hand up yeah I can take some of that um, I've been planning on monitoring those meetings and uh, although I do think that on a from a larger perspective at some point as as money really starts coming in and we start hitting the road I think <laughs> to have lobbyists like an actual hired someone who has all the connections in the state government and and is in the and is in the region you know who could stand to benefit from the work that they do directly all right thanks for that walker uh before i get to you jeremy um john walters did you uh, have any thoughts on this that you wanted to share um well well aside from the the uh the hairs on the back of my neck neck standing up and <laughs> I might be volunteering for comes up. Um, I mean, if <laughs> strange me, this isn't just a need for CB, CB fiber. This is something that probably all the CBs ought to have, whether or not they recognize it. Um, and I don't know if that's anything that's within the bandwidth of either Vicuda or does the does the broadband board itself have any sort of communications person or, or infrastructure? Um you know, so because uh, we don't yet, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for that, John. Um, let's see, uh, Jeremy, Matt. Uh, the idea of press coverage, if we can get these, you know, out in public. I mean, I, I think a lot, you know, the public. Uh, agrees with us, I think, in a lot of, you know, 
I don't know. Maybe we can kind of get a court of public opinion on our side that could help with some of the issues that we're having in terms of getting what we need to get this built. So, uh, I, from from just what I see on social media and you know talking to people, uh, there's still very very little awareness of the whole, the whole world of the CDBs. You know, uh, the board, you know, the delegates on the board are are up to their necks in this stuff, so they are aware of everything that's going on. But it, you know, despite the little efforts that I make. You know, not a lot of it is seen to happen to the general public. And, you know, that, that doesn't happen immediately. That's something where you have to basically hammer them over the head with it. Um, but um, it's <laughs> politely. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, it is an issue. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how often I see people on Twitter complaining about their their uh, Internet connection speeds and, and, and bemoaning the fact that they don't have any alternatives. Um, and I, I'm always tempted to write back, just wait a little while. <laughs> yeah, there is a need for more outreach. Uh, Jerry, you still have your hand up. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add on this? No, no, I thought I uh, lowered my hand. I apologize. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so I think that was that was Alan's. So let's go to Christopher. Anything you'd like to like to add? Christopher is actually here here with me at the uh, Maple Woods, by the way. <laughs> um, no, I mean we have the Waterbury uh, presentation on Monday, um, but uh, other than that, I think that's about that's about all I have to add. Okay, not super exciting. Christopher, you're. Your maple woods looks a lot nicer than Jeremy's, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I have the view side. Yeah, he has he has the the filter side. It's a big green screen behind him. This is where they shoot movies. <laughs> I I, th I think that that's R Rivendell back there, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? Um, Chuck. Two things. Uh, first, just as a as an aside, while I went to the select board to present, one of my select board members was actually experiencing a multi day internet outage. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, uh, consolidated was just down in Moortown for like four days straight, five days straight, and so he he was. He was really pushing on it, and uh, uh, so it was pretty funny to see that that happen. Um, the other thing I'll say is, uh, David Lawrence, when you go to the Middlesex Select Board, tell Peter Hood that if he does not act on this, Chuck Burt will come after him. Uh, he and I are, are longtime friends. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's great. All right, good, good news. Vermont is a small place. Uh, David Healy. I don't have anything to add. All right. Thank you, David. David Lawrence. I have nothing more now. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Matt. Uh, I'm not muted. Uh, nothing to add. Just thanks for everyone's work, and uh, let's get this moving. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Jerry, anything else? <laughs> nothing for me. Thank you all. Sure. Uh, John Walters, anything else? Nope. Thanks, John. Linda? I have sent an email to Representative Teresa Wood. She is the vice chair on the House Committee on Human Services, asking her if she would like to come to speak to us about equity issues. I have not heard back from her. I think it was the Finance Committee that was interested in this topic. So I'd like to know when the next finance committee meeting will be. When she gets back to me, I can present that date. So Linda, what I could say to you is that the finance committee meeting is um, the Tuesday after the PDC meeting. So that would be uh, October 26th. But uh, actually, policy committee has taken this uh, for action. So their meeting is the 28th. Right, Great. the policy committee would be the place to do it, Linda. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. All right, 
Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, Phil? I have uh, nothing more to add, just to uh, just thanks for everybody for their hard work. All right. Thanks, Phil. Ray? So I'd like to know, uh, people talked about uh, the public, keeping the public informed and, every, and everything. Um, how many of you have posted anything in Front Porch Forum about CV Fiber in the last month, the last four weeks? I see three hands, four hands, five hands. I uh, think I have. A handful of hands. You know, we we should yeah. have twenty. We should have twenty-one hands at least. You know, all of our, all of our communities, right? Uh, at least once, twice a month. Just saying. I have a I have a question about that actually. Um, so I've been posting uh, on behalf of Waterbury just in the Waterbury section, um, and at, at first I thought you know we really need to hammer this, and I I did it twice a week for you know, a week or two, and then I thought you know, I, that's probably getting annoying. And I backed it down to, to once a week. And I'm wondering what, what, what's everybody's feeling, you know, um, between like doing it enough to where everybody gets a chance to see it and, and respond to it without being so annoying that people start getting irritated. I, I would say a couple times a month. Uh, but you have you obviously recognize that some people will read it on Monday and some people will read it on Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera. But at least a couple times a month, I think we want to keep ourselves out there. Any other thoughts about frequency of communications? I, I would say the irritation factor is pretty minimal. Um, you know, uh, most of uh, I, I don't read 90% of the postings on any given day. I just scroll, I just scan the, the headlines. Um, so um, it doesn't take much effort to not read something that you don't want to read. Uh, so, you know, a couple times a month is a good good frequency that isn't too taxing on anyone but if you are if you are moved to post more than that i would say you know probably more than once a week might be getting a little wearing but um i wouldn't worry about once a week or anything anything uh, beyond that chuck yeah. Uh, Christopher, I, I would encourage you if you are motivated to post that much more frequently, uh, maybe come join us on the communications committee and and make uh, the entire board be able to uh, leverage the work that you're doing to be able to uh, you know also send those updates with a little more copy paste sort of uh, level of effort. Nice plug. I can consider it. Good swing, Chuck. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else, Ray? No, thanks. All right. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Siobhan? Um, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Siobhan. Tim? Hey, guys. Um, I'm glad to see everything's moving along. Um, I don't get to join these as often as I'd like because I'm in two bands and a full-time job and do shows on the weekends, but uh, sometimes when the meetings come up, I'm just not able to get to this. Uh, but I love seeing all the information and the updates when I do, and I love to see the minutes of the meeting. And I would say the uh, Front Porch Forum uh, posts, they have to be short and sweet, uh, maybe just with a link every time, because if you've ever noticed Front Porch Forums, uh, when people post long things, your eyes just glaze over them and scroll on to the next one. So you don't want to be that type of uh, uh, inputter coming on the front porch forum. And me and Ray share the same front porch forum for Northfield. Roxbury doesn't have their own. Uh, so whenever I see Ray has stuff up there, I try not to uh, double it and uh, uh, clog the uh, bandwidth or anything. But uh, I think shorter is better. And if there's more to be said, a link, a link is uh, the way to go to get something up. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, Walker. Um, I wouldn't discount our little best animal in uh, our communication world. All right. Can't hear you. Sorry, Walker. Walker, unfortunately, your uh, try turning off. Um, Try turning off the video because your audio came came out 
really, really terribly. We couldn't couldn't hear what you were saying. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Hello, hello. Great. I have horrible internet. Sorry. Um, so I just wouldn't discount the power of of uh, direct mail. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but sending just a card about who we are and what we're doing with a link or a, or some kind of contact um, would would reach some people that need reaching that might not be seeing this on Front Porch Forum or any other online source. All right. We've done a limited amount of that in, in the past um, direct outreach in terms of you know doing surveys and such, but I think I think we will likely um, do that when we're ready to actually actively reach out to folks who are along the route of where, where we have fiber going. Yeah. Um, so I will I will take the the last one here. Um, Josh Jarvis had something else come up. He sends his uh, he sends his regards that he couldn't make it. Um, there was something else I was going to add, but I am completely spacing out on on why, on, on what it was. But apologies for being late. Um, the elementary school is not going to be an option for the foreseeable future. Apparently, we were not actually supposed to be able to use the space based on district rules, even though I had approval from the front office staff and whatnot. So um, likely that I will be setting things up here. Um, Wi-Fi is good. Food's good. So we will... Uh, <laughs> keep going with that so with that um i have 717 and i will uh declare us adjourned bye everybody bye, bye everyone thanks <laughs>